Good afternoon, everyone. Big, big thanks uh, to Alex for, for having us down. Um, I'm Ed Wallet. Um, I'm F2 currently in London. I work in the Northwest Thames Deanery, currently doing general practice. A um, bit of background on me, trained at um, Imperial, um, and I founded a site called podmedics.com. Just out of interest, who had heard of podmedics before? Okay, so about half. Now, just so I can get an idea of every, where everybody is, um, I know that the structure of the course here is a bit different to how we are in London, but who's in their final year here at the moment? It's final year in terms of just about to sit finals. We're going to sit finals this year. Yeah. Okay, third year? Right, okay. Second year? And any first year people? Oh, brilliant. Lovely. Right, so I'm going to try and pitch it at the right level. Um, the, the aim in the next 45 minutes or so is to tell you everything that you need to know about renal medicine in order to function as an F1 and probably an F2 doctor. Now, if you open Kumar and Clark and have a look at the renal medicine chapter, you'll probably get an acute attack of palpitations. It's horrible. Okay. Renal medicine is an absolute disaster. All of the really, really clever people end up going into it because it's just a, an absolute minefield. However, what you actually need to know about it is quite little, quite not much, really. Um, and that's what I'm going to try and do, is tell you a little bit about pathology, some of the renal syndromes, and then go through renal failure, which is actually the thing that you most need to understand. Um, I'm going to assume that everyone has a basic knowledge of renal anatomy and physiology. Um, and by this, I mean roughly where the kidneys are, that there are blood vessels that supply them and that there are various structures within the kidney. I'm not going to sort of base my talk around sodium countercurrent exchanges in the descending loop of Henley or anything like that, but a little bit of anatomy and physiology is assumed. So first of all, what I want to do is give you three cases just to have in your mind as I go through the first half of this little talk. The first case is of a 35-year-old alcohol abuser who presents to A&E with confusion and melina, so passing of digested blood in the stool. On examination, he has signs of chronic liver disease and is pale and clammy. The blood pressure is 90 over 50, so low, and the pulse is elevated at 130 beats per minute. Investigations reveal uh, an anemia, so a low hemoglobin, 6.3, if we say a normal would be, say, 12 um, to 14, an MCV of 108, so if we say normal, it's probably about 90, so an elevated MCV. White cell count of 3.8, and LFTs show a gamma GT of 2,000, if we say a normal is 50, so highly elevated uh, gamma GT. The urine electrolyte, sodium 123, with a uh, normal of between 135 and 145, potassium 5.4, with a normal of 3.5 to 5, urea 27, let's say a normal up to 8, creatine 135, upper range of normal is 120. Okay, it's just a rough situation to keep in your mind. Second case, 17-year-old student who presents to A&E with a six-day history of a sore throat, flu-like symptoms, who now has frank hematuria, so frank blood in um, urine, swelling of her ankles, and a poor urine output. She had an ep two episodes of pharyngitis um, in the last three weeks. And then the third and final case is a 74-year-old man who presents to his GP, increasing malaise, back pain, associated with hesitancy and a poor stream of urine. Investigations show uh, for use and ease of sodium 134, remember I said 135 to 145 normal, potassium 6.4, so that's grossly elevated if our normal is 3.5 to 5, urea 31.2, so once again grossly elevated, creatinine sky high 1,000 and a PSA that's also very, very high, if we would say less than four as normal. An ultrasound of the abdomen shows bilateral hydronephrotic kidneys. Okay? So those are just three cases, just to have in the back of your mind as we go through, and hopefully um, they'll start to make a bit more sense during the course of this, this uh, lecture. So how do you think about renal medicine? If you were to stand back and take a sort of global view of it, the key thing is the pathology. And the way to really, really understand renal medicine is to just think anatomically, okay? So at the very basic level, you've got blood vessels coming into the kidney, you've got lots of things that the kidney does, but mainly um, important things, sort of the excretion of waste materials, regulation of fluid balance, homeostasis, a few hormones and things are produced there. And then you've got kidneys producing urine, which goes into the ureters, into the bladder, then out through these structures here. 
you can basically think about problems in three sections. So you can think of problems that occur before the kidney, pre-renal. You can think of problems of the kidney, renal. And then you can think of all the things, all the problems that happen after the kidneys. And that's post-renal. So very simple. Pre, renal, post. Okay, that's the general way to think about it. It gets a bit more complicated than that because the, you have to then think about what structures are in the kidney and what structures are there that things can go wrong with. And this is where the sort of basic knowledge of, sort of histology and physiology comes into play. Generally in the kidneys, from a pathological point of view, we can regard sort of there being three key structures where things happen. The glomeruli, the tubules, and the interstitium, so all the material surrounding um, the tubules. Okay. Is everyone roughly familiar with that? That's not too scary to anyone. Maybe a few people. Okay. So what I want to do now is just take that overview and go through what are the key problems that happen at each point. Okay. So as we said, we're going to start with pre-renal. And there are two sort of things that are important in supplying the, the kidneys. Obviously, the blood going into them and the vessels that carry that blood. And you can have problems with both. So the first thing, and if there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk, it's that the big, big problem with the kidneys that occurs most often that you're going to see absolutely tons of in the hospital and um, when you're an F1, etc., etc., is hypoperfusion. So if you don't have enough blood going into the kidneys, okay, then you can get kidney failure, and that has lots of different manifestations later on. Okay? So if you have a problem with blood flow, we call that hypoperfusion. So insufficient blood supply to the kidneys. If the kidneys don't have enough stuff going in, then not enough stuff comes out, and they can't perform their normal function. Okay? The nice thing about, what well, the nice thing, but the, the reassuring thing about this is that usually this is reversible. So if you can improve the blood flow, say a patient who's shocked, they haven't got a, lot, a large circulating volume, they're not supplying their kidneys, if you give them fluids, it'll improve, and they will start perfusing their kidneys again, and usually there isn't a lot of damage that's been done. However, if it's prolonged, this reduction in perfusion, then it can lead to this condition called acute tubular necrosis, okay, which I'll talk about in a bit. So that's the flow, and that's the absolutely key pre-renal uh, problem. You can also have problems with the vessels, okay? So this is the, the vessels that carry the blood um, to the kidneys. Perhaps the most common cause of kidney failure, particularly chronic kidney failure, in the Western world is hypertension, okay? So an elevated blood pressure. The problem with hypertension, I'm sure as you all know, is that it has lots of effects in atherosclerosis, and it causes eye problems, it can um, accelerate um, kidney problems, etc., etc. But the major problem is the thickening of vessel walls, particularly small muscular arteries and arterioles. Okay? So we're not looking at the renal arteries here, we're looking at the sort of downstream end, so the renal arterioles and the small muscular arteries. If, they, if all of these get thickened, there's luminal narrowing, and as you might expect, just from basic flow through a tube, if it's narrowed, you're going to get less flow, and that's going to lead to chronic um, ischemia, so chronic reduction in delivery of oxygen. And that leads to a gradual loss of nephrons, which can lead to renal failure. So if you don't have any nephrons, your kidneys can't work properly. The other big problem is atherosclerosis, which is obviously linked with hypertension, because hypertension can contribute to atherosclerosis. But this is a problem with the larger vessels, okay, particularly the renal arteries. And when we only talk about atherosclerosis here, we're talking about renal artery stenosis. Okay? And a typical patient with this will be someone who is an arteriopath. So we're going back to all the risk factors for atherosclerosis, you know, male, family history, um, who's a smoker, who's diabetic, who has a high blood pressure and a high cholesterol. You know, those are all the atherosclerotic risk factors. And these people get disease for roughly the same reasons, okay? Because they've got narrowed renal arteries, they get hypoperfusion, so not enough delivery of oxygen to the kidneys, which on a chronic basis leads to loss of tubules, the functional unit of the kidney. They also, unfortunately, get secondary hypertension. One of the consequences of losing all these things is that your body tries to respond and it produces all sorts of things involved in the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, all that kind of stuff. It leads to secondary hypertension. So you end up getting this effect as well. So both of those together lead to chronic kidney disease. And this is just an example. So when we're first talking about hypertension, 
these are the structures that tend to get affected. So this is a, just so this is a um, angiogram. Um, you've got the uh, descending abdominal aorta here, and you've got the renal arteries coming off here at about the level of L1. And then, as you see, there's a sort of what we call a renogram here, where um, the kidney lies. And all of these small muscular arteries are the ones that are affected by hypertension. But when we talk about renal artery stenosis, it's the big one. It's the big renal artery here. And as you can see right here, this is narrowed. Not as much dye is getting through. Okay? And that's it. That's all of the pre-renal stuff done. Remember, hypoperfusion. When you think pre-renal, think hypoperfusion. So now we get on to the glomerulus. Now, this is where traditionally things get really, really complicated but they don't need to be. Okay? You just need to know what a glomerulus is and what causes uh, the major problem at the glomerulus, which is called glomerulonephritis. So what is a glomerulus? It's a knot of capillaries, which is called a capillary tuft, that projects into the Bowman's capsule, which is at the top end of the functional unit of the kidney, okay? which is the, the, the tubule, the nephron. And that's supported by a surrounding network of connective tissue, which is collectively known as the mesangium. Importantly, the glomerulus is the site of ultrafiltration. So it's the site where um, lots of solutes within the blood are filtered. The pathology you need to know about for the glomerulus within the kidney is glomerulonephritis. And it's nephritis, so inflammation of the kidney, glomerulo of the glomerulus. So it's kidney problem of the glomerulus. Now, often in medicine, we talk about problems being primary or secondary. So primary, we don't really know why they happen. Secondary, we know there's an underlying disease process. Okay? And glomerulonephritis is one of the conditions where you can have primary, so idiopathic. We don't really know why it happens, but it does. And secondary, where another particular disease process is associated. And I'll talk about that in a second. But just from a conceptual point of view, if you imagine that the glomerulus is the site of ultrafiltration, it's a site of selective filtration, then any damage to that is going to lead to loss of that function. So you're not going to be able to um, ultra-filter. You're just going to start losing material that you don't want into the kidney. Okay? So the major problem with damage, you get leakage of protein and blood, okay? which is what you don't want. And that results in the syndromes of glomerulonephritis, which I'll talk about later, that are collectively known as nephritic and nephrotic syndrome. In terms of the secondary causes, the diseases or conditions that are associated with glomerulonephritis, this is a sort of rough list. Okay? Um, I don't really believe in many lists, but there are, are undoubtedly a couple that you have to know um, to get through medicine, and this is, this is one of them. Okay? This is the sort of um, group of conditions that uh, can lead to glomerulonephritis for various, various reasons, which I don't want to get into here. That's where it starts getting bit complicated. Don't worry about it. If you're scribbling the things, don't worry. This all goes up on the website and it's all free to get, so you'll be able to get it later. And I'll put up the slides as well. So this is the really... Please, please, please don't write any of this down. Okay? This is just to say... This is just to link in with the really complicated stuff that you're seeing Kumar and Clark. Okay? You'll read about membranous glomerulonephritis, focal segmental glomerulus sclerosis, etc., etc., etc. The point is, is that these are all types of glomerulonephritis. Okay? And they all cause different syndromes, so nephrotic or nephritic syndromes, depending on whether they leak more protein or more blood, um, within the kidney. Okay? But don't worry, this is just to link in with what you might have read about in the books. So, that's the glomerulus. The next thing we come to is the tubules, okay? which are the, the site of further filtration and reabsorption and things like that. This condition I've actually already spoken about earlier, when I was talking about hypoperfusion. Okay? This is what happens if you chronically underperfuse your kidneys. Okay? So this is a, a patient who comes in with shock and acute renal failure, and it's not corrected properly, and they end up getting this condition, which is irreversible. Okay? So major cause is ischemia due to prolonged reduction in perfusion. There are a couple of toxins, just to be aware of as well, that also cause problems with the tubules, um, particularly these ones are very important to know about, the ones you'll hear about a lot. Gentamicin, uh, which is aminoglycoside, increasingly um, in fashion in hospital medicine because it has quite a broad um, spectrum and wasn't used a lot in the past, so a lot of bugs don't um, 
have resistance to it. And then contrast media, which is of course used for CTs and uh, various you know, sort of contrast studies and stuff like that. But the big, big thing here is ischemia. If you hyperperfuse your kidneys because you're shocked and that isn't corrected, you might get acute tubular necrosis, which unfortunately you can't correct. So this is the issue. Pre-renal failure can cause renal failure, okay? long-term renal failure. And that is because of ATN, acute tubular necrosis. This is another sort of just a filler, really. I don't think it would be reasonable um, to know a lot about this at an undergraduate level, but um, there are a whole host of other tubular disorders that you'll read about if you dare to go near any of the chapters on this. Um, and these generally are due to excessive loss of things in the kidneys or inadequate um, uh, excretion. Okay? And they tend to be things like if you have a problem um, reabsorbing glucose, you can get glucosuria, so glucose in the urine. If you have a problem with absorbing amino acids, amino acid urea, phosphocystinuria, etc., and then there's a whole group of things called renal tubular disorders, one, two, and four, um, to do with inadequate excretion of substances. But this is just for completeness, I'm putting these things in. This is the key concept that you need to take, about, take away for tubular disorders. Okay, so that's it. Interstitial disease now. Interstitial disease is really nice because you can divide it quite easily into acute and chronic. Okay? So interstitial nephritis is the, the word that we use. So nephritis, problem with the kidney, interstitial, that's where the problem is. It's the interstitial bit of the kidney. The acute one tends to lead to acute renal failure and the chronic, chronic renal failure. And I'll go through acute and chronic renal failure um, in a bit. What's nice about uh, uh, the acute one is it's always due to the same sort of um, pathological mechanism. It's a type 1 hypersensitivity response. So that's your um, immediate degranulation of mast cells releasing IgE. It's the sort of uh, asthma attack, anaphylaxis to peanuts kind of response. The same thing can happen in the kidneys um, and causes acute interstitial nephritis. And the usual suspects are antibiotics. Not so much these, but antibiotics. So people who are allergic to penicillin and cephalosporins, if they get given them, they can get renal failure. And it's because of this. The other type is usually due to chronic use of drugs um, and it's because of persistent inflammation and fibrosis and non-steroidals are the absolute sort of key um, drug group that you should remember for that. The other key problem um, that's particularly important in kids when we talk about, uh, when we, we discuss renal medicine is pyelonephritis. Okay. So pyelonephritis is the sort of extreme complication of a urinary tract infection, where the infection has ascended from the bladder, where it's causing cystitis, up to the kidneys, and is now involving the whole kidney. Okay? And the way you differentiate this from just someone with a normal UTI with a bit of frequency and dysuria is that they'll be very, very unwell. Um, and they will have loin pain, usually symptoms of... Um, urinary tract infection as well, so pain on urination, and they may even get renal failure if the kidney, or if both kidneys are affected. And then, as I said, this is particularly important in kids because it can become chronic. So if kids are affected by multiple urinary tract infections, they can actually lose enough of their kidney function to develop renal failure. And certainly, there are a number of people out there with chronic renal failure whose etiology is multiple urinary tract infections. Um, as a kid. And there are lots of sort of scans that are routinely done now, and I'm sure you know about things like Dempsis scans and MAG3s and everything, to try and detect when urinary tract infections in kids are causing this major complication of um, renal failure. So the last bit we get to um, is outflow tract disease. Okay, so this is your post-renal. Okay? Now this is very much the realm of the urologists, okay? and I'm I'm not very surgically minded, so my view of urology is there are, there are only sort of three things that ever seem to happen. That's infections, stones, and tumours. Okay? If you're ever stuck in urology and anyone asks you, what are the causes of hydronephrosis? What are the causes of post-renal renal failure? You just go stones, infection, tumours. Okay? You will not go wrong. That's a, my understanding of, of urology. So basically, in post-renal, any problem after the kidneys can cause 
backflow, because obviously the kidneys are constantly producing urine, and if you've got a blockage afterwards, it's sort of there's a pressure effect which goes back to the kidneys, and that the kidneys don't like the pressure, and they lose their function. So you could have a stone, so you could have a, a big stone sitting here, so things start filtering through properly. You could have a malignancy, either of the bladder or the ureter itself, blocking flow. You could have prostate hypertrophy, so you could have a problem right the way down here, after the bladder actually, that leads to back pressure all the way up here. Um, chronic urinary retention, perhaps because of neurological disease, problems with the, the bladder. Um, and then this last complicated one, uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis, which is just basically where there's a lot of fibrosis um, in the space behind where the ureters lie, and it causes sort of tethering of the ureters to that space, and they can't fulfill their function of drainage normally. But basically, any problem that happens after the kidneys can lead to back pressure, which can stop the kidneys functioning correctly. Okay. Just a two-second break for me to have some water. Are there any questions at this point? So just to summarize, kidney pathology as a whole is pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. Pre-renal is usually hypoperfusion, okay, because the patient hasn't got enough circulating volume, but it can be a problem uh, to do with, say, hypertension or atherosclerotic uh, renal disease, renal artery stenosis. Renal disease is either a problem of the glomeruli, the tubules, or the interstitium. If it's of the glomeruli, it's glomerulonephritis. If it's of the tubules, then it's either, um, it, well, it's usually acute tubular necrosis. Interstitium is either acute interstitial nephritis, chronic interstitial nephritis. And then for outflow disease, think about the three things, the three cornerstones of urology, so stones, infection, and malignancy. Okay. So let's move on now just to talk about how these things manifest in, in the patient. It's all very well talking sort of theoretically about it, but how do these things actually, actually present? The big problem with renal disease is that the presentation is not very specific. You know, a guy comes in with central crushing, chest pain going down his left arm, and he's pally and clammy and things. You can be pretty sure that's a, an MI. But in renal disease, things tend not to present that way. Patients with renal disease have sort of non-specific features and malaise and fatigue. They may or may not have urinary symptoms. They might be polyuric, polydipsic. They might be oliguric. They might be anuric. You know, there's nothing really specific that you can pin down. The key with renal disease is really the investigations. Um, but if you're looking for clinical features, that's sort of signs and symptoms, often the thing that will be more obvious in a renal patient is the underlying cause compared to the actual renal failure or the renal disease. So the thing to look for is the underlying cause in this group of people. There are, however, two absolutely key syndromes that you need to recognize and be able to describe and know a few causes of. And these are the nephrotic syndrome and the nephritic syndrome. If you notice, they all have the same stem of, of neph, which is sort of kid, uh, Greek kidney. Um, and then it's either rotic or rhytic, okay? Um, and they are triads, okay? So a set of three symptoms. Now, the way I kind of think of it in my mind is in nephrotic syndrome, um, kind of rotic, it makes you think of sort of um, more sort of Michelin man, sort of the O is big, okay? So this is the one that's associated with edema, okay? So the big problem here is that, remember what I said before, when you have glomerulonephritis, you leak blood or protein, okay? In nephrotic syndrome, the key thing you lose is protein, okay? If you lose protein, then you get a low level of albumin in the blood. One just follows the other because albumin is the key blood protein. If you lose lots of albumin from the blood, if you go right back to year one, for those year ones who remember the Starling hypothesis to do with the distribution of fluid between the intracellular and the extracellular compartments, if you don't have a lot of albumin in your blood, you can't pull back the, um, the fluid from the outflow end of the capillary network. Okay, so you get a buildup of that, which causes edema. With that as well, you also get a few other things that the people who are doing their finals would probably be more interested in. You get a hyperlipidemia, an elevation of lipids, 
you get reduced immunity, so these people are very vulnerable to infection. And the reason for that is if you lose um, protein, you use immunoglobulin as well. Um, so you're less able to mount a response to infection. And also you um, lose intrinsic anticoagulants, um, such as protein C, protein S, antithrombin, things like that. So you actually are hypercoagulable. So things like DVT is much more common in this group of, group of patients. But the absolutely key thing is edema. And nephrotic syndrome, as you might have guessed, is a manifestation of a problem with the glomerulus. So in terms of clinically what you'd see, the characteristic thing with nephrotic syndrome is periorbital edema. That's the most common place where patients will get um, edema. Okay? And then it can lead to peripheral edema. Okay, so that, that, this would probably be your pity, peripheral edema. And then if really, really severe, it can lead to ascites here and this, which is uh, bilateral pleural effusions. Common causes. If you're, you know, th th these are some of the things that um, I mentioned earlier and some of the scary sort of terms. But if you want to remember two important causes of nephrotic syndrome, the ones to go with are diabetic nephropathy, okay, so problems with the kidneys or glomerular nephritis in association with diabetes, which is one of the important secondary conditions I spoke about earlier. And in children, this condition called minimal change disease. Okay, so this kid, for example, probably has minimal change disease, leading to nephrotic syndrome, which has led to his um, uh, swelling around the eyelids. And this disease, minimal change disease, responds very, very well to steroids, and most kids get better. Now, let's move on to the next one, which is nephritic syndrome. Okay, this is also a triad, but the way I sort of think of it is in nephritic syndrome, edema is um, less of a, a prominent feature because there's less proteinuria. Okay? So they tend to get more hematuria. So they lose more blood rather than protein when they have their glomerulonephritis. The other problem with this condition is they tend to get fluid overload. Now you're probably thinking, oh, what's he talking about? Fluid overload, surely that would cause edema, you know? And it does cause edema, okay? But it causes acute onset edema, which usually fills up the lungs rather than the peripheries and round the eyes. Okay? And the key clinical feature here is um, brown or Coca-Cola colored urine, which simply reflects the, reflects the fact that there's blood in the urine, okay? And once again, two causes to have um, available if someone asks you for causes of nephritic syndrome are in adults, a condition called IgA nephropathy, and in children and young adults, something called post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is um, a condition where um, a young child or an adult has a throat infection caused by streptococcal infection, and then they get an immune response to that, which unfortunately leads to glomerulonephritis as well. Okay, so that is basically the presentation. You've got nephrotic syndrome, which is all to do with protein and leads to lots of edema. And you've got nephritic syndrome, which is all to do with blood and tends to lead to that Coca-Cola Coca coloured urine. The last thing I really want to talk about is renal failure. Okay, Acute and chronic renal failure. Now, this is the absolute sort of cornerstone for those of you who are going to be doctors fairly soon of you know being an, an f1 i can guarantee you that every day that you're an f1 you will see and treat someone who either has acute renal failure or has had acute renal failure as part of their course of treatment it is really really common so what is it well it's a rapid loss of glomerular function. Okay, that's kind of obvious. It's acute and it's renal failure, so you lose your function of your kidneys. Okay? Typically occurring o over hours or days. If you want to be really technical about it and look at the actual blood tests that we use in acute renal failure, I'll, I'll talk about those in a sec, you can say that it's a, um, a fall of creatinine. No, that would be a rise, probably. A rise of creatinine um, to greater than 50% of pre-mortem no. Let's say a loss of kidney function to less than 50% of pre mortem function. That's a bit confusing, that statement. So what's the problem with, having, with your kidneys failing? Okay, there are four problems with the kidneys failing. 
One of them is uremia. Okay, one of the key things that the kidneys excrete is urea, which is a natural, um, which is a sort of product of nitrogenous um, metabolism. And you have to have to get, a, get rid of your urea to maintain homeostasis. The other problem is that you lose your ability to maintain your fluid balance. And if that happens, you, get, you can get fluid overload. So for example, when we talked about nephritic syndrome, I said one of the features is fluid overload, acute onset of fluid overload, which can cause pulmonary edema. You can't control your electrolytes, so you get alterations of sodium and potassium and lots of different things. And you lose the ability to regulate your acid base. Okay. Now, these are the absolutely key four things with acute renal failure that you must, must remember. Okay. Uremia, failure of fluid balance that tends to lead to fluid overload, usually in the form of pulmonary edema. Failure of electrolyte regulation, which leads most often to an elevation in the potassium. Okay. Failure of acid-base regulation, which always tends to go to the acidic side. Okay, so it usually causes an acidosis. Those are the four cardinal features of acute renal failure. <coughs> Once again, it's really, really easy. What are the causes of acute renal failure? They are pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. And this should all be fairly um, obvious from what I just spoke about. Once again, beware. Acute renal failure can become chronic renal failure for this, usually because of this reason. The clinical features, as with all kidney disease, are fairly unreliable. Um, those of you who know the podcasts and things will know that I tend to use this table for organising investigations. Um, I would highly recommend, um, for those of you who are just beginning, that you get into the habit of using systems like this to sort of gather your thoughts and for those of you who are coming to the end that you start doing this because it makes your life a lot easier and what you'll start seeing is that you sort of rather than opening a textbook and reading about a condition and then just learning the list of investigations what you start doing is you start sort of reading about a condition and then drawing a little table and filling it in just from what makes sense and this is a much healthier kind of way of learning and then of applying your knowledge so I, I really do recommend that you make use of, of this kind of table Okay, so what I do is I divide investigations into, into cultures, okay, so that's anything that goes to microbiology, basically, into blood tests, which are either arterial, so from an artery, or venous, uh, from a vein, imaging, so anything done down in radiology, scopic or biopsy, so scopic would be things like an endoscopy or colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, and biopsy, obviously, taking a histological sample to look at um, in the lab, and then finally, this last one, which is functional, which is a sort of any test that is specific to a specialty. So, for example, in cardiology, I would say that an ECG is a functional test. It's fairly specific to cardiology. In respiratory, I say spirometry is a functional test. It's fairly specific. So what I'm going to do now is just go through these investigations and sort of maybe get you to, to sort of shout out what you think I might be looking for with each one of these. Okay, so the first one under cultures would be urinalysis and culture. Anyone think of why I do that? Protein, yeah, exactly. Okay, so one of the causes is nephrotic syndrome. There might be lots of protein in there. Anyone else? Another, another one? Yep, hematuria. So blood might be nephritic syndrome. Okay, so it could be blood. And then one more? Infection. It's that simple. Okay, and then culture for infection as well. It really is that, that easy. Let's move on to um, bloods. Okay, so arterial is for acidosis. Okay, remember as I said, the four cardinal features of acute renal failure are uremia, fluid overload, hyperkalemia, and acidosis. So all patients who you suspect might have acute renal failure have to have an arterial blood gas to look for acidosis. Venous bloods, there are lots and lots of venous bloods that you can do, but the really important one is gonna be the potassium because that's the thing that's going to kill the patient. Okay? So you have to do a, you use an easy urine electrolyte panel to look for a hyperkalemia, elevation in potassium. Obviously, you want to diagnose that they have acute renal failure, so you need to look at their urea and creatinine, which, if elevated, suggests that they're not removing them properly because their kidneys aren't working. 
In terms of establishing a cause, you can look at various autoantibodies. I don't want to get bogged down in that now. It's a whole different thing. You can look at lipids. Remember, hyperlipidemia, nephrotic syndrome. You can look at the liver function very occasionally. Uh, alterations in liver function can be associated with kidney problems and hepatorenal syndrome, that kind of thing. But we're getting complicated now. These are the absolutely key tests here. For imaging, you do a chest X-ray. Anyone think we do a chest X-ray? Yep, someone's mouthing about that. Fluid overload. Okay, so pulmonary edema can be diagnosed on chest X-ray. That's why you do it. A bit more difficult, this one. Abdominal X-ray. Yeah, stone. Okay, so um, stone, one of your causes of post-renal renal failure. Um, actually, 85% of stones, of renal stones, show up on an abdominal film. It's not the gold standard investigation for kidney stones, but 80 to 85% of stones will show up in an abdominal film. Ultrasound, you need to do for many reasons. Um, you want to have a look at the kidneys, basically, and you want to do that without exposing the patient to lots of radiation, doing a CT scan, etc. And what you want to look at is you want to look at the size of the kidneys. You know, is one smaller than the other, indicating this is more of a chronic picture or an acute on chronic picture. You want to look uh, so at the, the size, the symmetry. You want to look for... Um, what we call hydronephrosis, which is basically dilatation of the outflow of the kidney. And that suggests that there's a problem downstream. There's a post-renal obstruction, which means that the outflow is dilated. You want to look for hydro, uh, hydronephrosis. You want to look for uh, hydrourea, which is exactly the same thing. So that's dilatation of the ureta going down rather than the kidney itself. Very rarely you'll do a renal biopsy. That's the realm of the renal physicians. And then this one, ECG. Why might you do an ECG? And don't say tall, tented T waves. Hyperkalemia, yeah. So all patients with acute renal failure have to have an ECG. Um, and this is the reason. Because hyperkalemia can kill you with an arrhythmia. Okay? And the, the first sign that you'll see on an ECG um, in hyperkalemia are tall, tented T waves. There are lots of other ones, but that's the most important. So, how do you treat acute renal failure? Now, most of the time, and you would have guessed from what I've said so far, the treatment would be fluids. And the reason for that is the most common cause is pre-renal. most common cause of pre-renal is hypoperfusion. So if you give them more fluids, it's probably going to get better. And that's true. However... In renal failure, you have to treat the complications of renal failure before you treat the renal failure. Or you have to at least sort of understand that that's more important. Okay? Now, the reason for that is the acute complications that I spoke about earlier, these three, okay, will kill you quicker than just the renal failure. Okay? So hyperkalemia, you have to have to treat, otherwise your patient will die of an arrhythmia. So the way that you treat it is you protect the heart from the effect of the potassium with something called calcium gluconate. And then you try and get rid of the potassium. And you do that by giving um, insulin and uh, dextrose because insulin causes a net shift of potassium from the blood into the cells. Okay. Pulmonary edema um, is very easy to treat. You just tend to give the patient diuretics to get rid of the excess fluid. Um, acidosis is very difficult to treat. Please, 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 when you start your training, don't rush off and give every single patient with acute renal failure um, an acidosis bicarbonate, okay, because, and then sue me when they die. Um, it, it, um, this is the reserve, once again, of renal physicians, okay. Acidosis, you have to recognize and recognize that it's a problem, and it's one of the indications for someone having dialysis as an emergency, um, but it's the one that you can, you're least able to treat in the acute setting. And then um, you can think about treating the actual problem. Okay? And for pre-renal, it's going to be fluid resuscitation. That makes sense. For renal, because most of the conditions that happen in the kidney are related to um, an inappropriate immune response, such as in that post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis or all those glomerulonephritic syndromes and things, 
these patients tend to get immunosuppression, usually in the form of steroids. If you remember, I said the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in kids is minimal change disease, and that group of patients respond very well to steroids, and most of them get better. Okay, so immunosuppression is the cornerstone of management of um, renal, renal failure. And then post-renal, uh, if there's an obstruction, you either relieve that obstruction. So someone have had an, if someone had an enlarged prostate, you'd pass a catheter to relieve the obstruction. But if, for example, they had a massive stone, um, then you might have to put a tube above that stone to relieve the pressure. And that is called a, a nephrostomy. And then for those of you who are about to sit your finals um, or who are interested, this is the indications for dialysis. And basically, it kind of makes sense. Basically, if you're not controlling the kidney failure with these things, then the only other thing you can do is dialyze the patient. Okay? So if they've got symptoms of the uremia, such as encephalopathy or pericarditis, you need to dialyze them. If they have hyperkalemia, an elevated potassium that's not responding to um, your insulin dextrose, they need to be dialyzed. If they've got edema that's not responding to diuretics, they need to be dialyzed. And finally, and very importantly, if they're not passing any urine at all over a long period of time, um, you, they need to be dialyzed as well because they're going to get these very, very soon. Okay, so let's now go all the way back to the cases and see if I can sort of, it makes more sense now. So this one is our 35-year-old alcohol abuser who's passing blood in his stool, okay? His, he's got chronic liver disease and his blood pressure is low and he's tachycardic, okay? So what, what are we thinking here? Is it pre-renal, renal or post-renal? Pre-renal, okay? He's shock, he's got shock. His blood pressure is low and his pulse is elevated, so he's not perfusing his kidneys, okay? Investigations re reveal an HB of 6.3, okay, which is very low, and the, probably the reason for that is because he's losing lots and lots of blood um, through his stool. Why might he be losing blood? What's he probably got? Yeah, he might have varices. Varices more often causes an upper GI bleed rather than a lower GI bleed, but you're quite right, can do. It's probably um, you know, a, a gastric ulcer, a perforated gastric ulcer. Um, either usually a posterior perforation, which goes into the uh, in front of the arteries in the stomach. Um, he's got a raised MCV um, and a. Uh, if I put the gamma GT, I didn't put the gamma GT on this slide, but a very raised um, gamma GT. If you ever see a raised MCV with a gamma GT that's also raised, okay, think alcohol. Okay, it's just a sort of one of the rules. If you answer enough questions for exams and things, you'll learn that. If you ever see a raised MCV and a raised gamma GT and patients anemic, cause is most likely alcohol okay, or a vitamin deficiency. And then looking at the urine electrolytes, his sodium is low. Okay? His sodium is low because he's hypovolemic, so he's lost um, fluid. His potassium is high, however. And his potassium is high because he's got acute renal failure. So his potassium has gone up. His urea and creatinine are also both elevated, okay. Can anyone explain why, can anyone explain the ratio, why the ratio is important? Yes, so that's one thing. It, it can do. It can indicate dehydration. Um, it's more to do with the onset, though, okay. If someone's walking around for a long time with renal impairment, they tend to have a much higher creatinine than their urea. And we'll see that in a second when we look at the other case. Okay. But you're quite right. Acutely, if someone's very dehydrated acutely, then their urea will go up before their creatinine goes up. Okay. So don't be put off. You might see someone, someone's blood test, for example, who's in acute renal failure, and their urea is very, very high, and their creatinine might even be normal. And you're thinking, well, this person's not in uh, acute renal failure because their creatinine's normal, and creatinine is how we measure renal failure. You might be wrong. You have to look at both of them together and consider the time course of what's happening. So here, his urea, if we say a normal urea is, say, you know, less than eight or something, here the urea is really quite high. You know, it's m multiple times um, the normal value. But the creatinine is only just a bit high with an upper range of 120, and that's for that reason, because this is an acute situation. So this is an absolutely classical case of pre-renal failure. 
okay, with complications as well. The second case is our 17-year-old who's had streptococcal throat infection, I've just given it away, and then develops hematuria, swelling of ankles, and poor urine output. So which syndrome is this? This is nephritic syndrome. Yeah, frank hematuria, Coca-Cola colored urine. She's also losing a bit of protein because proteinuria is part of the triad, so she's got swelling of her ankles. She's had a sore throat. So what's the most common cause of nephritic syndrome in young adults and children? Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Okay. So this is a typical case of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And then the last case is a post-renal obstruction, uh, post-renal renal failure. So here, 74-year-old man, he's got increasing malaise, back pain, he's got hesitancy and a poor stream to his urine. Okay. Worryingly, he's got a very, very high um, potassium okay, as a complication of his renal failure. And if you look here at the ratio between the urea and the creatinine, okay, this is very, very dramatic. It's the flip, it's the reverse of the first case. So here, the urea is still elevated, but the creatinine is really, really elevated. This is 10 times the normal level. And that means that this is a problem that's been going on for quite some time and has allowed itself to get established. And then his PSA is 123. I mean, if you consider a normal is, is less than four, that's very, very high. So this, this chap has got a gigantic prostate, um, probably because of malignancy. And what's happening here is he's got massive, massive back pressure of urine that's unable to drain, leading to acute um, uh, renal failure. And then this is supported by the ultrasound, because on the ultrasound, if you look at the ureters in the kidney, he's got that thing that I spoke about, hydronephrosis, which indicates back pressure. Okay. Very quickly chronic renal failure. Okay. Chronic renal failure is important. There's only there's very, very few things you need, I think you need to really understand about chronic renal failure because you won't be involved really in its, in its management. But it is asked about sometimes um, in exams. Chronic renal failure is obviously persistent and irreversible. That's a really important concept. A lot of acute renal failure is reversible, but chronic renal failure tends not to be. There are five stages of it that you can characterize by the amount of um, um, reduction in the glomerular filtration rate. Don't really worry about this, but just know that there is this condition known as end-stage renal failure down here, which is when the, um, the, the function of the kidneys has got to such a low level that that person needs help with their kidney function, and that help is usually given in the form of dialysis. So causes. So almost anything that I spoke about as causing acute renal failure can, if it goes on for long enough, cause chronic renal failure. If you want to learn three common causes, then I suggest these three. So diabetes mellitus, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and glomerulonephritis. And remember, there's hundreds of glomerulonephritis um, conditions. As with other conditions in renal medicine, it's a multi-system disease. It presents in very peculiar ways. The important systems that it affects, however, are the nervous system. Okay, patients with um, chronic renal failure tend to get peripheral neuropathy, very importantly. And they also get very tired and they get levels of fatigue, and that's because of direct involvement um, of the nervous system, um, particularly because of urea. So uremic, remember I spoke about one of the manifestations and indications for dialysis is this thing, renal encephalopathy. Okay, chronically, high elevations in blood urea cause alterations in the nervous systems. One of them is uh, peripheral neuropathy, the other is um, encephalopathy. The absolutely core thing you need to be aware of in patients with chronic renal failure is that these people get highly, highly accelerated atherogenesis. Most people with chronic renal failure die because of a heart attack or something like that. Nothing related to the kidney. And the reason is they get really, really accelerated um, atherogenesis. And we don't really sort of know how we should be treating these, these people, but probably a preventative role with statins and things like that is probably most appropriate in this group of people because they are so vulnerable to getting uh, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, etc. They get altered taste perception. Um, very importantly, 
they get reduced absorption of calcium. Um, those of you who are renal physiologists or enthusiasts of renal physiology will know that one of the important functions of the kidney is the final hydroxylation of vitamin D3 to form 1,2,5-dihydroxycholicalciferol, um, the active form of vitamin D3. Um, and these patients lose their ability to do that, and they get, because of that, various problems uh, with their bones. Okay, they get low levels of calcium, parathyroids respond to that, and they get this condition here with bone cysts and renal <coughs> osteodystrophy. Going back, we know all about this. So hyperkalemia, acidosis, those are all features of acute renal failure. Patients with chronic renal failure get them as well. One of the other hormonal functions of the kidney is the production of erythropoietin, which is one of the key hormones that stimulates the bone marrow to produce red cells. And patients um, with reduced kidney function don't produce as much, so they get an anemia. And the anemia that they'll tend to get is an anemia of chronic disease. Okay, so it's one of your normocytic anemias. They also get impaired platelet function, and this is because of the uremia, so they bruise very easily as well and the bones we've spoken about. The last slide is all about the management, okay? And I put this up not because I'm going to talk at length about any of these things, but just to say, always, just like when we had the investigations with cultures, bloods, imaging, etc., for your management, always, 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 from this point onwards, put your management options into this table. If you're sitting down and making notes on the whole Kumaran clock, which I don't recommend that you do, make sure that your management fits into this table. Make sure your investigations fit into the other table because your life will be a lot easier, I promise. For the management of chronic renal failure, the key things you need to have in your mind are to treat cardiovascular risk factors aggressively, and that's because of the accelerated atherogenesis. So these people should be on a statin. They should have good blood um, pressure control. They should have good blood glucose control if they're diabetic, etc. Unfortunately, most patients um, eventually require uh, renal replacement therapy, which usually is in the form of dialysis. And I'm not going to go into dialysis. There are lots of different forms. But just know that most patients who have chronic renal failure, even if it's only grade 2 or grade 3, um, will certainly over time progress to that last stage, that end-stage renal failure that requires dialysis. Okay. So that's it for me. Are there any questions? Are there any burning questions? No. Thank you very much for coming. The recording of this, if you want to revisit it, um, hear your own voice on it, doing, do whatever, then uh, go to the site, pomenix.com. Um, it's there, it's free. You don't have to do anything. It's just there to watch for you. If you have any further questions or anything like that, please give me a, drop me an email and I'll be happy to um, answer them. Thanks very much.